The Unshackled Waves, episode 116. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. The biggest news story in Australia over this holiday period has been Victoria's African youth gang crime wave, with violent crimes being committed all throughout Melbourne, particularly in the city's west, by men described as being of African appearance. Because this is such a huge topic which needs to be explored in detail, we thought we would do an in-focus show looking at exactly what crimes have been committed, the reactions to it from Victorian authorities and other political observers, and exploring possible solutions. To do this, I am joined by fellow Melbourneian, Associate Editor of The Unshackled, Tom Peroni. Tom, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tim. Uh, now, we pr- uh, probably should explain first why you're coming uh, to us via uh, phone. That is because uh, your uh, original phone, which you've previously used to uh, call into the show, was uh, stolen at the uh, Melbourne Milo event. Yeah, so unfortunately, um, as I did discuss in a, an earlier podcast with Emilio, my phone was uh, stolen from me, and I'm uh, just temporarily using a um, just a, a cheap second-hand phone that I managed to get my hands on. So, yeah, unfortunately, the technology isn't fantastic, so we weren't able to do a Skype call, um, but hopefully just doing a, um, a voice call will be a, an adequate substitute. And may I ask who stole the phone? Yes. Um, so as I as I discussed in the podcast with Emilio um, a few weeks back, it was a, uh, a gang of African youths from the uh, the Housing Commission at I think Kensington, so across the road from where the Milo rally was being held. Um, so I think it is somewhat fitting then that, given that we are doing a um, uh, you know a topic today discussing youth crime, or African youth crime specifically, um, it is somewhat fitting that I was. Uh, uh, I suppose a victim of African youth crime in Melbourne. Yes, uh, definitely. We are uh, both placed, uh, well placed to uh, discuss this uh, topic. Uh, well, uh, you were the the victim uh, of uh, cr- uh, a crime. I'm also from Melbourne, but luckily I'm in one of the more uh, safer uh, areas. But there's been a lot of uh, interstate uh, commentary. So you know, for for all those people, yes, we are local to uh, Melbourne. So this is an issue that affects us. But let's start with a a timeline of the uh, crimes of the the past month because it's really uh, it's been described as a crime wave. I I say it's turned into uh, a tsunami. So it started with, uh, there was, uh, and you actually reported on this time, a uh, a machete murder by an African gang. Yes, so this would have been um, probably a month or so ago, I believe, uh, somewhere in the western suburbs. Uh, It was a a gang of, I think, was it half a dozen or a dozen or so African men uh, murdered a man with me. Machete in the western suburbs of Melbourne. Um, so that's the sort of thing, you know, it's, I wouldn't really say it's the sort of thing that we're used to in Australia, that sort of behaviour and those sorts of news stories. So it's, it's definitely a, a real eye opener for many people, I think, to hear about incidents uh, such as that one. And that uh, Housing Commission, which was uh, outside the uh, Melbourne Milo event, there was also uh, a, a young man who was uh, attacked. Uh, twice uh, by uh, Af- African gangs uh, during a, uh, a Saturday night. That was uh, covered on the news quite a bit. He uh, was attacked and then he went, He was, you know, crying for help and then the, the people that came over next, they bashed him again. Yeah, um, so I believe that was, what, like a week on from the, the Milo show. Um, so, yeah, once again, um, you know, a person just minding their own business who was uh, unfortunate enough to you know, walk through the wrong area. Um, I just, yeah, it just breaks my heart to hear that this guy, you know, as you said, didn't just happen once to him, it happened twice. And then as uh, this is when the really high profile uh, uh, crime started, uh, uh, this one was lucky to be captured on a camera. There was the uh, St Kilda uh, Beach uh, African gang uh, fight where they uh, were... 
uh, robbing the uh, passers-by. Uh, this was on a Wednesday night and th Thursday morning. Uh, they uh, uh, took the uh, wallets and phones of uh, goers at, at the beach and then and fought each other, which was uh, captured on camera. And there was also uh, the next day another uh, gang confrontation in uh, Collingwood, which was described. Uh, the people involved in that were described of as mixed appearance. I'm not sure what exactly means that wasn't uh, captured on camera. So it uh, didn't get the same media attention, but that was beamed into living rooms around the state. And it really, uh, that was the beginning of like, wow, you know, this is, you know, because St Kilda Beach, that's a popular uh, place for, um, you know, people to go in Melbourne to, you know, have a good time. It's got a, a good nightlife there. And, and so, and so that's a, you know, area that people associate with a, uh, with a good time and a tourist spot in Melbourne. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I think it really impacts on uh, the Australian culture. The fact that this is a, a beach which represents everything which is great about being an Australian. The fact that we can, you know, we can go and have a, a day out. You know, have a swim, have a surf. You know, go to one of the restaurants there and you know have a bite to eat and drink afterwards. So I think the fact that an area like that is now being, um, you know, reduced down to this level, reduced to this sort of a um, this sort of a culture, I think it's a, a massive tragedy. And I, as I said, I think it definitely represents a significant blow to the Australian cultural identity. And then there was the uh, riot at a uh, Air and Airbnb property in Werribee. Um, these two teenage girls, they, they'd rented out a, a property in Werribee and uh, they, uh, fr from what I recall, advertised it on uh, Facebook and it attracted all these African youths who came and the police riot squad had to, had to be called in. Uh, and uh, uh, there, was ba there was basically a huge, there was you know, property damage uh, um, uh, to the uh, premises and it had uh, gang graffiti uh, sprayed all over it with Apex and uh, uh, Menace to Society. Yeah, no, so I heard about this. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the fact that it's an Airbnb property as well, so it wasn't even their own property which they were destroying. They they went to the effort of yeah, renting out someone else's home. Um, and yeah, I just, I can't fathom how anyone could think that is socially acceptable. And I, I really don't think that it is socially acceptable in Australia. So I think incidents like this really, um, I think they really send a message to us that it's, I think it's about time we took a stand and um, you know, started to, I suppose, respond to these threats to the Australian way of life. And then there was, uh, and this is where uh, it was clear to the public that not even the police were could effectively control uh, what was going on because uh, two police officers were were cornered in. Uh, I can't remember which uh, western suburb it was in, but an African gang cornered them in an alleyway, and thankfully uh, nothing happened to them. But it's clear that. Uh, you know these African youths. They, you know, they they weren't you know scared of the pl uh, the police at all, and were willing to you know ha uh, you know do uh, as much physical harm to them as they've done to uh, other people. Yes, yeah, so I think when you when you're living in a society where even the police are unable to um, effectively enforce the law, I think that's when you've you've really got a bit of a problem on your hands, quite frankly. Um, and obviously, the police are meant to be there to protect the public. Um, and if the police themselves aren't even being uh, respected and um, if they're unable to, you know, do their jobs effectively, then I think, um, you know, something needs to fill the void. Something needs to happen. And, yeah, effectively, I don't think that people are going to stand for this for too much longer. I think that um, a solution has to be... Um, I think that we've got to come up with a solution. I think that the problem needs to be addressed. And clearly the current state of affairs is... You know, it's unacceptable and it's not, um, I suppose the, the current approach of the current government just isn't, isn't doing the job, unfortunately. And then the, the, the most high profile incident was a police officer was uh, attacked at High Point Shopping Centre. He was trying to apprehend a shoplifter and then he was besieged by a group of Af African youths and was uh, kicked in the head uh, by one of them. Now this, uh, uh, te uh, teenage uh, accused who allegedly assaulted the uh, police officer. He uh, miraculously was granted bail by a magistrate, but then uh, 
uh, no less than 24 hours was uh, back on remand because he'd breached his bail by having a mobile phone uh, because uh, and his justification was, oh, it was too inconvenient for me not to have a mobile phone, so he just breached bail. Yeah, well, I mean, I don't, I'm not really sure what these people need mobile phones for. Um, I don't think they exactly live, um, shall we say, traditional lifestyles. Um, but, yeah, I think that this, this person was, very likely not to have even been thrown in jail. Um, I mean, if I was the judge, I would have made sure that he doesn't see the light of day for a few years. Um, but yeah, for him to just disrespect the um, the orders of the court in such a way, I think it really does speak volumes of the uh, the quality of character of some of the people who have been imported into Australia. And then there was the uh, Tarnit uh, Community Centre, which was uh, trashed. Um, uh, that uh, although um, you know it wasn't a physical assault on somebody, it was still you know this had uh, been a centre you know which would have cost millions of dollars to to build, and it's you know for the benefit of you know people like you know African immigrants, and it's and it's just been torn apart, had uh, you know uh, gang graffiti you know written on it. It's you know it's disgraceful. Yeah, so I think the fact that um, as you mentioned the intentions behind this program were to, um, I suppose, encourage this particular community to, you know, to integrate and to avoid crime and all that. And the fact that um, clearly, you know, even these efforts have been um, largely unsuccessful, as we can see with this incident, I think that really suggests to us that maybe a different approach needs to be, um, needs to be used here, that maybe this whole idea of, you know, investment in community programs and diversity and but else it's clearly not it's clearly not doing the job clearly we need a different approach i think people are sick of having their um, homes broken into they're sick of you know gang beatings they're sick of machete attacks and i think they've got every right to be sick of um of this sort of culture i think that we have a right to feel safe in this country and um yeah as i said the the current approach clearly is not adequate it's clearly not doing the job and despite the high media scrutiny of African youth uh, uh, crime, uh, there was a gang that went on a rampage in the western suburbs of Melbourne, which included a, a violent home invasion. Uh, they stole a car. Uh, they uh, assa- assaulted a person, um, you know, on the on the street, and uh, they were pursued by police in the in the stolen car, which they they crashed, but um, still managed to uh, get away and. Um, you know they, these home invasions they're they're all, they're all too common there's uh, su- uh suburbs now that are you know living in f- uh, fear or they sleep with baseball bats under underneath their beds and some families are actually deciding that they've, they've had enough and are moving away yeah well, i think that's tragic to hear that i mean you hear about families who've uh you know lived in one suburb or even one house for you know many years generations even in some cases and I really don't think that they're the ones who should have to leave. They haven't done anything wrong. Um, you know, they've been decent, law-abiding, hard-working citizens. I think the, the onus really needs to lie on the people who are, um, who are to blame here. So, I, you know, it does break my heart when I hear about incidents like that. Um, but, yeah, as I said, I think that we as a community need to uh, address the fact that, you know, clearly the current approach is not working. Clearly uh, a different view is needed. Um, and yeah, as I said, I just, I, I can't really see the current situation lasting for too much longer. I think the people have had enough and, um, yeah, I, I really, I hope at least anyway, that these sort of circumstances will not be existing six months or even a year from now. Now, the reaction of the Victorian authorities is that, uh, at, at best can be described as slow. Uh, they, they started the, the previous month by releasing the latest crime statistics, which they uh, spun as, you know, Victoria was becoming uh, safer, which, although the overall uh, crime rate had reduced, this was due to uh, massive drops in crimes such as arson. The violent crimes that, you know, people are worried about actually... Uh, increased and when these uh, cri- crimes started to happen this month, they they first said it was uh, just a, a youth problem. Yeah, no. See, I don't really buy that narrative. The idea that it's a yes, a youth problem. Um, I mean, if you look at uh, figures which have been released by the Victorian Police Force, this is based on 2015 data. 
Apparently, Sudanese migrants are 44 times more likely to break the law and 70 times more likely to commit a home invasion. Now, those are statistics which have been released by the Victorian Police Force. Um, I mean, obviously, if it's, you know, common knowledge, it's publicly available. I don't think you can really look at that and then say, oh, well, it's a youth problem. No, it's not a youth problem. It's a Sudanese problem. Okay, these are people who are from a third world country who have a radically different culture who who we are actively importing into our country. You don't have to be a genius to figure this out. If you import a whole bunch of Australians to a country, Australians obviously like, shall we say, drinking beer or playing sport. That's going to alter the culture in the country in which we go to. You probably have more beer consumption and more of a sport-focused culture. You could look at Indians, for example. Indians, uh, when we think of you know an Indian stereotype, maybe they like eating curry, they like playing cricket. If Indians immigrate to a country, you're going to have that host nation which they've gone to is probably going to have more curry consumption or more people watching or playing cricket. Likewise, if you have people from a third world country where rape and murder and violence are normalised and you import those people into your country, you don't have to be a genius to figure out what's going to happen. Now, as I said before, we have these statistics to back this up. Um, you, you can't really deny statistics. Um, I don't think you really need to be a genius to figure out what is at the core of this problem. It's not youths, okay? It's not young people. It's not the fact that they are young. It's the fact that they are from a part of the world where this culture is normalised. Now, I don't want to live in a country where that culture is normalised, so I, for one, am willing to call this for what it is, and I would hope that other people would be um, brave enough and have enough common sense to do the same thing. Then the Victorian government and Victoria Police, they said it was an African youth problem, but uh, don't call them gangs because, you know, that will uh, incentivise them somehow to uh, commit uh, more crimes, even though uh, it was, you know, they'd been... The graffiti had, you know, apex and uh, menace to society on it. Like they, they are a gang. So, so what else are you, are you meant to call it? Well, exactly. Um, I mean, in my experience, they don't even um, they don't even have the courage to do any of this um, individually. They would never attack anyone one on one. They always want to go after people ten on one. Um, yeah, no, it is a gang issue. It's not individuals. They hunt in packs. Uh, and once again, this is clearly a uh, an aspect of their culture. And as much as uh, certain segments of the media and the government and whoever else want to push this idea of diversity and cultural enrichment, I'm pretty sick of it, quite frankly. I'm sick of the cultural enrichment. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm not really enjoying the, um, I suppose, the um, consequences of these sorts of policies. So I think it, um, for people to be pushing this narrative, to be pushing this idea that this is somehow enriching for Australia. I think it's about time we pointed out that the emperor has no clothes, that this is a failed policy, that we're not being enriched. Okay, these people are not improving our country. As I said before, they are 44 times more likely to break the rule and 70 times more likely to commit home invasions than non-Sudanese immigrants. Um, Clearly, that suggests to me that these people are a problem. Um, Now, don't get me wrong. I, you know, I would like to think that there is some sort of um, humanitarian aspect in regards to helping people who are from a war-torn country, but I can only be sympathetic up to a certain point. I think that when you um, start rolling out the uh, you know the red carpet for people to come to your country and they then disrespect your laws and your culture and your way of life, they start committing home invasions, carjackings, rapes, murders, whatever else, I think that's when you've got to start to draw the line. So as far as I'm concerned, um, we've got to call this for what it is, We've got to be realistic about this and we've got to try to solve the problem. The problem here is Sudanese immigration. Let's just call it for what it is. Let's not, you know, dance around that. This is one particular group of people who are, you know, actively engaging in a certain type of behaviour. Now, if you want to reduce the likelihood of that sort of behaviour occurring, you've got to pinpoint where it's coming from. And it's coming from one particular community within Melbourne. And of course, we we got there in the end from the government and the police who said they are dealing with uh, African street gangs and their rhetoric uh, increased significantly. They said that they want to, you know, see these, you know, violent uh, offenders, you know, locked up and, you know, describe their crimes as horrific. But we are still, you know, lacking leadership during this, you know, crucial time because both the Premier Daniel Andrews and Deputy Premier uh, James Molino are on holidays. The uh, police Commissioner uh, Graham Ashton, he's still on uh, stress leave. So we have the the acting uh, Chief Commissioner Shane Patton, who, from what I uh, hear from um, uh, 
uh, police association figures is is actually uh, you know an, an okay uh, type person, but they're they're Apex. They you know the the Moomba um, you know ro- uh, fight or you know even if you want to call it right that happened in I think it was about March. Uh, 2016. So this has been uh, a problem for for nearly t- nearly two years. Yet it seems that the Victorian government they've been too busy, you know, uh, trying to pursue their you know politically correct social justice, you know, virtue signalling agenda. Meanwhile, uh, meanwhile the uh, you know the safety of the state. I mean, I remember reporting on the beginning of the year, Daniel Andrews had his you know anti-racism uh, police force, which is. And, and at the same time, we're seeing, um, you know, all these, uh, you know, uh, patriot activists charged uh, following the, the the Milo clash. It seems that, you know, they're, they're more interested in going after, you know, people they view as, you know, evil, you know, right wingers rather than the people who are actually committing the violent crimes. Yes. Well, interestingly, if you look at um, if you look at this from a political strategist point of view, I would argue that there is largely a quite a perverse incentive which exists for the Andrews government and I suppose the Labor Party more broadly. I mean, this is a a, a party or a, a political ideology which is uh, obviously attracts votes based on people voting for bigger government. They're going to vote for welfare and handouts and whatever else. Obviously, they can see that this particular community, based on their background, is more likely to uh, vote their particular ideology. So it's in their best interest for people from this part of the world to keep on being actively recruited or imported into Australia. So for the Andrews government to push this rhetoric about, oh, you know, anti-racism, whatever else, I think we've got to be realistic about this. This is obviously a guy who realises that if he doesn't win elections, he doesn't have a job. Um, I think he can obviously see that this is a demographic which is more likely to vote for his particular party, and therefore there really is quite, as I said, quite a perverse incentive which exists there. He's obviously less likely to... um, crack down on this issue, he's less likely to uh, pursue more uh, more of a, you know, realistic sort of a, a discourse in relation to it. And I think that we really need to do, to I suppose, do more to uh, call out politicians who won't, um, who won't name the elephant in the room. And in this case, you can really see that the Andrews government has dropped the ball there. Um, so as I said, I, I think you've got to look at this um, from that broader uh, political point of view and you've got to see I suppose you've got to look at the the incentives which are motivating the Andrews government to behave in this way. Oh, well, it's the, the it's a state election uh, year with the um, uh, state election due in November uh, last Saturday in November, and you know uh, Andrews government backbenchers are getting nervous uh, about, about this issue, and uh, you know they're they're wanting the the premier to uh, to take action and. You know, when when you get close to election time, you know, self interest, uh, you know, rules the day. And so, if um, you know, da- uh, Daniel Andrews is you know pressured to you know drop this you know politically correct approach to government, uh, he he will do that. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, I think he's obviously an opportunist. The man is a career politician. If you look at his resume, he spent, I believe, six years in university before becoming a political staffer and then becoming a politician, I think, by the time he was in his late 20s or early 30s. So the man has never had a real job in his entire life. All he knows is politics. He can't do anything else. Realistically, if you have a, um, I suppose, any sort of career which is reliant on um, a certain social phenomenon, you're obviously going to create a, as I mentioned before, a perverse incentive. So from the Daniel Andrews perspective, I suppose, from the perspective of a career politician who is reliant on, um, uh, shall we say, less productive members of society voting for him, I think that there is very much that that incentive or that motivation for him to appeal to this particular segment of the community. The federal government has also uh, ramped up the pressure on the the Andrews government to to do something. We saw uh, an intervention from uh, Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, uh, Greg Hunt, who is a federal cabinet minister um, uh, from Victoria, uh, Jason Wood, who is a uh, federal uh, Victorian uh, liberal backbencher. He actually wants uh, the federal police to um, get get involved in tackling African youth crime uh, by having the, the gang squad, you know, 
assist uh, uh, Victoria Police. Probably the most high-profile intervention, though, was Home Affairs Minister uh, Peter Dutton, where he and uh, he appeared on 2GB, and of course Peter Dutton's uh, not uh, known for uh, not being around the bush, you know, said, you know, we've got to call it from it is, you know, African, uh, you know, youth uh, gang gang violence, and said, you know, people of Victoria, uh, you know, they're they're scared in their homes, scared to scared to go out to uh, restaurants and slam, you know, politically correct p- approach to policing, and uh, as he called them, joke sentences from the a judiciary which has been uh, stacked by uh, civil libertarians. Now, this was, you know, d- despite all the crimes we've seen, this was actually mocked. Uh, uh, there were, you know, these lefties on Twitter who, you know, po- uh, po- uh, posted, you know, p- uh, pictures of themselves, you know, eating out uh, uh, at restaurants in Melbourne saying, see, it's completely safe. And, uh, uh, the acting uh, pr- uh, premier Tim Pallas said, "Like, oh, you know, uh, Peter Dutton's comments were irresponsible." And uh, Anthony Albanese, who's not even from uh, Victoria, uh, also said, claimed that, "Oh, because I, you know, went to a restaurant in Melbourne, uh, there, there is no, um, you know, crime problem." Like, they're they're still uh, these lefties. They're still living in their alternative universe where. You know, that because, you know, nothing bad has happened to them, that everything must be fine. Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, it does, um, it really does reek of hypocrisy on their part. But I think in regards to the uh, the response of the federal government, I think it's something that we really need to acknowledge here, the fact that um, ultimately the responsibility does lie with the federal government. They're obviously the ones who are uh, in charge of immigration policy in Australia rather than the state governments. Now, for all the rhetoric that we've heard from the Liberal Party about stopping the boats and... Um, you know, all, all this sort of rhetoric about illegal immigration. I think we've overlooked um, the real elephant in the room, which is legal immigration. Um, we can go on as much as we want about stopping the boats and whatever else, but this is a government which is perfectly happy to allow two to 300,000 people to enter Australia each year. I mean, this is a country where you've got the majority of the population living in four major cities. Um, despite being a massive, uh, you know, massive landmass, we really don't have the... Uh, I suppose we're not developed enough to be having this level of mass immigration entering our country, and particularly when it's from, uh, as I said, third world war-torn countries like this, which have radically different cultures to our own. I think the really, uh, I suppose the the buck really has to stop at the um, the actions of the federal government. So I think this is just a an example of the Liberal Party trying to play politics. If they really cared about this, then they would significantly alter their immigration policy. Um, but we've seen with, obviously, Malcolm Turnbull, Tony Abbott, and even prior to that, John Howard. These were politicians who were perfectly happy to open the floodgates, um, and they did so in the name of um, so-called, you know, economic development. Um, but they, they more or less threw the uh, the baby out with the bathwater, I think. Um, so, yeah, it's, you know, as much as there is hypocrisy on the part of the left, I think that we've also got to look at the um, the so-called conservative politicians in our, uh, who have served in our country and... Um, as I said before, I think the, the, the ultimate responsibility really does have to lie with them. Uh, probably the most disturbing uh, denial came from uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Lex uh, Lazary, who he, uh, even though he's a, a sitting Victorian judge, has a, a Twitter account, and he posted a photo of himself out to dinner. Now, it's interesting that uh, you know three uh, Victorian uh, federal MPs were were dragged before the Victorian courts for contempt for criticising uh, a judge. Yet uh, here we have you know a judge seeming to uh, criticise a, a politician and get involved in a political issue, and you know that doesn't exactly fill you with confidence that the judiciary is taking this issue seriously. No, exactly. You're right. I mean, we are meant to have separation of church and oh, sorry, uh, separation of powers in Australia, and obviously the actions of this particular magistrate, um, you know, very much violate that concept. So it is a worry. Um, obviously, this particular magistrate does have uh, political leanings, which he isn't afraid of um, publicly expressing. So I think that um, in order to restore legitimacy in the, not just the Australian courts, but I suppose the legal system more broadly, I think it is important to have uh, magistrates serving on the bench who um, who aren't going to go out and, um, I suppose, endorse a partisan uh, political position, as we have seen from this particular judge in this case. Uh, that's it. We don't get uh, called before the court for contempt for, you know, daring to be critical of him. 
Oh, who knows? Who knows? <laughs> now, the uh, uh, African community leaders' response, assisted by the you know mainstream media, they've you know said, "Oh, the you know problems are you know are crime, uh, poverty, and uh, you know racism itself." They've they yeah, they've tried to you know play the victim themselves, saying that you know this is you know uh, uh, tarring you know all you know African Australians with uh, with uh, with the same brush, and like many of them are you know are successful uh, you know lawyers and and business people. But of course you know we and this is the the, the whole thing. They 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 claim that we're talking about you know all you know Africans. Like of course there's um you know there, there's plenty who've you know uh, t- uh, t- Taken their 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 second chance at, at life, you know, to to their full, fullest extent, and you know, and, and another thing I noticed in one of the Guardian uh, columns is that oh, you know, a, 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 every group of like three Africans is now viewed as a gang, which is, which is just absurd. I mean, you know, we're not fearful of you know like you know a group of Africans we see on the street. We're afraid of the ones who go out and, and attack people. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, I think it is quite intellectually dishonest for certain people to push this agenda and say, oh, well, you know, look at this uh, this bit of anecdotal evidence about this, you know, this Sudanese immigrant who came here and became a lawyer. Like, yeah, obviously, you know, it would be absurd to suggest that every single Sudanese immigrant is a criminal. Um, but at the same time, I think we've also got to be realistic about this. Um, as I mentioned before um, earlier, there are statistics which, you know, quite clearly prove that this is a problem which exists specifically in the Sudanese community. You even had a, uh, I forget his name, but there was a, um, a Sudanese soccer player who I think he plays for one of the Melbourne teams who came out and openly um, admitted this, that yes, this is a problem within the Sudanese community. Um, so I think for these people to, to push this, uh, this narrative or this particular argument that, um, you know, that it's some sort of a, uh, a racist agenda that's being pushed, I don't think that that's really... Um, it, it doesn't really uh, stand up, I don't think, intellectually. Uh, as I said, it, it's not necessarily an argument, uh, an argument against every single Sudanese immigrant, but at the same time, there is clearly a systemic problem which exists in that community. And I think if we cannot uh, pinpoint where exactly this problem originates from, then we're never going to be able to solve it. So in order to you know, address this problem in the right way, I think you've got to call it what it is. And yes, as I said, it is very much a problem within the uh, Sudanese community. And I've heard of a zero backlash against, uh, you know, African Australians in terms of, you know, being racially abused uh, on the street or, you know, vigilante, you know, Australians, you know, beating up, uh, you know, people of African appearance, you know, uh, you know, ordinary Australians, you know, they don't do things like that. You know, they, they, they want to see the issue addressed through, you know, our you know, political system, which is how, you know, the uh, Australian system of government works. Yes, you're right. Um, I think, yeah, you know, the average Australian doesn't usually, you know, they're not going to be the sort of people who are going to take things into their own hands. Generally speaking, you know, we are lucky enough to live in a country where we haven't had a whole lot of uh, political unrest throughout our nation's history. So I think most people usually assume that when a problem of this nature emerges that the political system will deal with it. Having said that, I think we are living in a very, shall we say, very unique, in which the, uh, the political system isn't what it once was. I don't think that we have the same calibre of politician, we don't have the same calibre of leadership as we once did. We've gone from living in a country where you had, um, who was it, the, uh, the Labour Prime Minister, who was a former train driver, um, uh, I, I forget his name, but he was a, an Australian Prime Minister, I believe, in maybe the 1950s or 60s or somewhere thereabouts. He used to have, uh, you know, people who would who would get involved in politics for the right reasons. It wasn't a career path for them. They got involved because they genuinely cared, because they genuinely believed in making this country a better place. They genuinely loved Australia and they loved the people who lived there. Um, I don't think that's the case anymore. I don't think we can... We can't be... Um, we, we don't have the luxury anymore, I suppose, of looking towards our politicians for that sort of leadership because they're just not going to provide it. All they care about is winning elections and reading about themselves in the paper. So as I said, I think at one point in... Uh, in Australian history, it wasn't adequate, uh, I suppose, mentality or attitude to have. But unfortunately, it's just not the case anymore. And until we start uh, electing politicians who are who are in it for the right reasons, I think unfortunately we're just going to continue even further down that particular path. 
But of course, governments can talk tough and you know pass、uh, legislation which、uh, you know introduces、uh, tougher sentences. But、uh, part of the problem is the the judiciary handing out you know these、uh, you know light、uh, sentences to you know Afri- African youths. You know they get you know community orders, and as we've seen, they you know get bail when they you know commit you know violent offences. There seems to st-、uh, be this you know. Cultural view in the legal profession that you know it's cruel to lock up you know any type of youth that are、uh, you know they're they're just you know troubled people who、um, you know or if we send them to、uh, jail that'll you know hard, harden them, harden them up more when the the reality is that you know probably these you know young people if they are to be rehabilitated they need to you know go to jail so they can have you know access to some of these you know rehabilitation programs and you know so it is a、uh, not only a deterrent you know keeps the community. Community safe. I mean, we really need a cultural change in our legal profession that you know really puts the、uh, you know needs needs and safety、uh, of the community first, and realizes that sometimes you know jail is just what a person needs. Well, yes. I mean, I personally am somewhat skeptical of this narrative that、uh, prison is there as a a means of rehabilitating particular members of society.、Um, I think particularly. In- Particularly in this, this case, I would be in prison as a way of just keeping everyone else safe. I think if you're the sort of person who's breaking into another person's home at two a.m.,、um, you know, hold a machete to their property, I don't think you're the sort of person that can be、um, effectively rehabilitated. Personally,、uh, maybe I don't have enough faith in our justice system.、Um, you know, perhaps that's the case. But as I said, for me personally, the priority is just keeping other people safe. The priority is ensuring that other people don't have to、uh, experience these same traumatic events. And as I said, I think that、uh, our politicians and also, as you mentioned, our,、uh, our judiciary as well, very much have a responsibility to ensure that that happens.、Uh, I don't think we should be emphasising the、uh, the rights or the individual freedoms of the criminals in this case.、Um, I think, as as far as I'm concerned, if they're willing to behave in such a way, then they don't really. I don't think they're really entitled to these rights and freedoms. Um, so yes, as far as I'm concerned,、um, I don't even think that prison is an adequate、um, approach. I think,、uh, particularly in cases where these are immigrants from other countries, I would rather we just deported them, and we have every right to do that on the basis of international law. We can quite easily just send these people back to Sudan. They are Sudanese citizens as well. Keep in mind.、Um, so yeah, as far as I'm concerned, I wouldn't even want to be paying tax to、um, to maintain their standard of living in Australia. I wouldn't be wanting to pay taxes they can. Rot away in a prison for twenty years.、Um, I don't think that's no. Like I don't think that's fair to be honest with you. And like I said, there are other you know alternative solutions available. And yeah, as I said, I just I can't fathom why anyone would oppose the deportation of a violent criminal. It's just it's absurd to suggest otherwise. Yeah, if we can deport them and get them, you know, off our hands, then you know we should definitely、uh, do it. And、uh, I notice these lefties say, "Oh, you know, why don't you, you know, deport, you know, white、uh, criminals?" Well,、uh, the thing is, if they're Australian citizens, you know, we can't. Like,、uh, it would be great if we could, you know, deport, you know, every, you know, violent criminal we have in Australia. But when the option is available to us, yeah, we want to make sure that, you know, they're not. Our problem anymore, and they they go back to the、uh, go back to the place where you know ba- basically all these problems started. Exactly. Yes.、Um, as I mentioned before, I you know I can I can appreciate、uh, the humanitarian aspect up to a certain point. I can appreciate the idea of being charitable towards those who are less fortunate, but obviously you need to draw the line somewhere. And when you're actively importing people who are、um, quite clearly violent criminals. Um, I yeah, I think that that's where I sort of draw the line,、um, and I don't really have any sympathy for anyone, regardless of what they've been through. Anyone who wants to break into another person's home and violently threaten them with machetes and whatever else, I don't care what you've been through.、Um, I think they've got to go back, and I make no apologies for holding that view. And、uh, I think another issue that needs to be explored is that、uh, youth offenders should、uh, face the same laws and as punishment and punishments as、uh, adults. Because,、uh, and this was put forward by、uh, Peter Farris QC, who's a、uh, 
uh, retired conservative uh, barrister. He talked about how these youth offenders, they know that, you know, they'll go before the children's court, you know, get a light sentence. And so they can pretty much, you know, act up until they're, you know, 18. And like, pretty, uh, uh, you know, a 16 year old, for example, is you know, capable of committing, you know, uh, as horrific, you know, violent offences as an adult. And, you know, I, I think, and basically the impact on, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're being attacked by a 16 or an 18 year old, it's still, it's still a traumatic event for you. And I think that the perpetrator, no matter their age, should face the same consequences. Well, I mean, you mentioned that, uh, that age of 18. I believe that there are actually examples or incidents in which uh, there were grown men in their 20s um, who were committing crimes and being uh, charged in the same way that a, a so-called youth would, and they were being sent to youth detention rather than adult prison. Now, as I said, these are grown men in their 20s. These are adults. These are not children. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's not even really in, uh, a cutoff of 18. Uh, I've heard about, you know, 21, 22-year-olds who are uh, treated as used by the courts. Uh, now, as you said, you really can't differentiate that. I mean, you know, most of these people, they, you know, they, they're no longer in school, they're working jobs, they're, um, they're very much adults in every sense of the word. So I don't, I don't quite buy into this narrative that they're, um, they're supposedly used and therefore entitled to uh, some sort of different treatment. And of course, we need to look at the issue of further immigration uh, to Africa. The, obviously, the talk in the past couple of years is about you know stopping you know Muslim immigration, but you know the, the Australian people there, or uh, I should say more specifically, the Victorian people, you know they're they're starting to get you know really angry that you know this you know is a problem that our governments have foisted on us, you know, imported you know, into Australia. And, you know, why would we, given this problem, like, why would we want to, you know, keep, you know, importing more? Like, and yes, you've, you've spoken uh, about, you know, uh, the humanitarian aspect of it, but it should always be, um, you know, the, the Australian people first. And, you know, if, if, you know, if the cost of, you know, rescuing, you know, refugees from the other side of the world is, you know, putting the safety of Australian citizens at risk, then I would say it's not worth it for us. Well, yes, it really does speak volumes about the simplicity of the uh, mainstream immigration debate which exists in Australia. I mean, we were willing to have a good what, month or two in which um, gay marriage dominated the, uh, the realm of the, the mainstream political discourse in Australia. And I think people really are overlooking the, uh, the more concerning and legitimate political issues which exist here. Now, as I said, if you look at the mainstream discourse in relation to immigration, it doesn't really get any more sophisticated than, you know, stop the votes or let them stay. And that's pretty much it. Um, ideally, I would want to see a, um, a debate or a national conversation, which is, I suppose, which places more of an emphasis on differentiating between different types of immigration. I mean, you have skilled immigration, you have unskilled immigration, you have immigration from English-speaking nations and non-English-speaking nations, you have immigration from developed countries and undeveloped countries. I think we need to start differentiating between these different types of immigration. Now, clearly an immigrant from, say, for example, New Zealand, the United Kingdom, the US, or the uh, Canada even, for example, I think people from these particular countries are going to be far more likely to integrate effectively within Australian culture. Similarly, if you're um, you know, importing people with a, uh, a qualification of some sort, let's just say an engineer or a doctor, a lawyer, someone who is obviously well qualified, I think that, once again, people with these sorts of backgrounds are going to be um, far more likely to integrate effectively. And once again, we should probably place more of a priority on, um, on immigration from these particular backgrounds. But like I said, if you look at the mainstream discourse, in relation to immigration in Australia. No one wants to talk about this. No one wants to discuss these issues. And it's really just as simple as, oh, stop the votes or let them stay. And I just, I can't fathom that Australian mainstream political discourse has become that unsophisticated and that basic that people won't, won't consider anything deeper than just that. I mean, it's the elephant in the room. It is the major issue facing this country right now. It is the major socio-political transformation which is occurring in Australia. And I think that the, the country that you and I grew up in, you know, back in the, the 90s and 2000s, I think that that country no longer exists. And I think it's a, a massive shame. And I think that we can quite clearly blame mass immigration policies on that fact. 
Well, Tom, we hope for uh, Victoria's sake that uh, these uh, crimes uh, uh, slow down uh, being uh, perpetrated, but uh, uh, sadly we've, we're pretty uh, pre uh, pessimistic about this. But uh, thank you for uh, joining me today and you know, discussing you know, w uh, what is the, the most pressing problem uh, in Australia at the moment. Oh, it's been a pleasure, Tim. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. I'd like to remind you all once again to vote in the 2017 Unshackler Awards. There are 10 awards with 10 nominees in each category, with the winners determined by a poll of our followers and announced on Australia Day. A new category has just been posted, which is the Unshackler of the Year, the most prestigious award, so make sure you have your say. Thanks once again for your company, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.